Hey guys, thanks for coming to my session. Um, I've tested the Wi-Fi before we get started, so everything's going to be, uh, everything should be okay. Fingers crossed. Okay, so um, my title, uh, the title of my session is uh, getting started with, with Windows Server Containers, um, and I don't work for Docker or anything, even though I'm, I'm wearing a Docker t-shirt. Definitely looks like that, um, but I'm not here to sell you Docker. I'm just here to talk about it. Um, give the concepts, really talk about the processes, and really go through what containers means for Windows Server, and you guys can make your own decision up. Um, but it is a really fascinating tool, and I really want to go through and, and share with you guys uh, some of the insights I've had into it, and some of the experiences working with it. And we'll just jump right into it. So uh, just covering the agenda to get started off is going to be what are containers. So we're really going to start off on the fundamentals here, on the basics, just really say, you know, what is a container when we refer to something like Docker, which you've probably heard of before. Uh, we're going to do some working with Docker, so we've got a few practical examples to go through and share how, how that works. And also we're going to do some building and deployments. So we're going to create some images, we're going to push some stuff around and um, get an app running up in, in Azure on a container host, and you guys can all hit the app from your laptops and stuff and, uh, and kind of get the first-hand experience of you know, accessing an application that's running in Docker. It's just a bit of a secret, it's exactly the same as if it was running on a VM, so you won't notice anything different, but the back-end infrastructure that pieces it all together is, is quite different and quite unique. So, jumping right into it, what is a container? So, you know, when we think about what a container is, we can sum it up very simply, um, you know, in a basic essence, to really say it just wraps a piece of software in a complete file system needed, you know, that contains everything that is needed for that application to run, and only things that are needed for that application to run. So historically, when we start thinking about software and we start thinking about you know, what software we might deploy to servers, we haven't really had much say in what else is on that server. We've said, you know, we just have the base operating system and whatever else is installed in that, you know, all the versions of PowerShell, all the versions of everything, and we also get our app, right? We didn't have much of a choice in that. Um, we could, you know, systematically go through and uninstall a whole bunch of stuff, but now we're in a position where we start talking about things like, um, you know, we start to talk about the cloud and we start to talk about running our applications in the cloud. You know, there's a cost associated with everything. So now it's really important more than ever to really be sure about what we're actually running up there and what we're paying for in the cloud. So that essentially this is where the concept of a container comes from. We really want to just have exactly what we need and nothing more. And you'll notice a trend in this uh, when you start going to uh, more and more talks throughout the next couple of days where people are talking about, you know, even this morning, um, talking about slimming things down, making them smaller, making them faster. It's, uh, it's a clear future for, uh, for our industry. So another thing that uh, containers offer, they offer essentially a way to bridge the elements of development and operations together. So we have this aspect where we um, traditionally as ops guys, like I, I have a, a background in operations also, uh, and I've you know worked with servers a lot and you know had to stand servers up for the development teams that wanted to deploy their applications, right? So you know this is this is my sort of you know area or, or silo, I guess. Uh, and then you'll have the developers who want to just build their application, like they're just like, man, I don't care, you know, that's just a server, that's your problem. Um, I just want to deploy my application. So one of the things that Docker actually allows and, and containers actually allow now is to shift some of that responsibility over to the developers. So we can say to the developers, hey, you know, you can actually build your own system, your own file system that encapsulates your uh, application and package that all up into a unique image uh, and actually push that in through some sort of CI CD pipeline or through to uh, something that might be handled by a more operations focused team. But we are shifting some of the responsibility uh, back to the developers to say, you know, you really have uh, you know, full control of what's in here. Do you know exactly what's in here? Uh, so it's no more like, oh, you know, you didn't give us this on this server. Well, you could have added that in. So there's also a collaboration aspect when you bring those two teams together. Um, and containers are part of one of the many tools that can bring that together. So it's not the, the icing on the cake or the silver bullet, it's just a, uh, one of the reasons that you know, they can collaborate easier. So usually when you like look containers up online or you've done a bit of research or you've looked around and talked to people, you usually see like this sort of image where people are like, yeah, yeah this is, you know, this is a container and they, they encapsulate it by saying, you know, you've got all of your stuff like nicely packed inside as if you just moved, you know, across countries or something and you've got all your things in there like you're moving house or something. Um, but it's not like the reality is, you know, this, this can be the ideal solution, right, where you have everything in there. But most of the time it usually ends up looking something like this if you're just getting into, you know, playing with containers to start and, and really working around with them. So it can be like this where you end up with a, a broken container with a whole sorts of holes in it. And I think one of the things I want to highlight today is, as well is um, how to avoid this situation where you do have a container that looks like that because it's not healthy. Um, and also, you know, some of the, some of the tips for um, 
working with the deployment of the, the containers, which can be kind of the tricky part, essentially. So there's a couple of types of Windows Server containers, which we're going to be focusing on today. So we have two types. We have the Hyper-V containers, and we also have the Windows Server containers. So essentially, the difference when we start talking about the two different types of containers is, is essentially at the isolation level. We have Hyper-V containers, which offer a different isolation level than Windows Server containers. When we start talking about Hyper-V containers, we're talking about uh, they're not actually sharing the host's kernel. So in, uh, on the opposite side of that, where you have uh, standard Linux-type containers or Windows Server containers, they actually share the host kernels, uh, the host operating system's kernel. Um, when we start talking about Hyper-V, we actually have an associated Hyper-V machine that actually encapsulates running that, that uh, container. So it's, it's more secure in a sense where you have your own resources provisioned for that specific container. Um, there's also quite a lot of other features with the Hyper-V containers, and, and um, I think there's actually some more information on that uh, in another, another talk. Um, I'm not sure by who, but I think it's tomorrow. Sorry. But we're going to be talking about uh, Windows Server containers today and really focusing on this topic. So what is Docker? You've probably heard um, a lot of people talking about Docker. Docker is essentially the engine that drives containers for the Windows Server platform. So when we say Windows Server, we're talking about Windows Server 2016 in a sense. Uh, but it is the, the engine that powers containers uh, on, on the Windows platform and also on the Linux platform. So we have a shared engine uh, that is used between multiple operating systems, multiple platforms to tie things together. So it's been unified in that sense. It is an open source project on GitHub, as you can see. Um, it's uh, developed in, in Golang. And it is a really, really popular and kind of a success, success story in the open source community. It's one of the major open source tools that's been actually you know, picked up by um, you know, one of the big, bigger companies like Microsoft and said, hey, we want to incorporate this into our operating system. So that, I believe, happened early last year. And that was one of the huge milestones for not only a company like Microsoft to kind of go, hey, we're going to incorporate this open source um, product, which they have been doing a lot more of, which is awesome but also for someone like Docker to really collaborate with them and, and get their product into such a, a well-known operating system like Windows Server. So <laughs> I had a look before. I was um, sitting in the hotel, and I was like, I heard someone, uh, I overheard someone saying, like, oh, geez, it's like a hipster technology. Like, you know, we're not, we're not going to, people wouldn't really use that because it's, it's so new, and I think it's just kind of a fad. So I, like, had a look online, and this is actually, like, the third or fourth uh, top result when you just type in Docker space. It's like Docker hipsters. So I actually was like kind of curious because I think this is it's something that um, you know a lot of people would, would think they just go you know it's just one of those fad technologies that no one's really that interested in and you, know, you have a lot of hipsters who are, who are really into this sort of thing but it's not really the case you know this thing being picked up by a company like Microsoft and being trusted enough to be incorporated into the operating system like that is, is a huge milestone um, and it's not a representation of a fad technology it's something that is here to stay it's something that. Uh, really revolutionizes the way we work, and you know it's it's some something similar along the lines of um, you know this is one of those changes. It's, it's not an incremental change like Jeffrey was talking about this morning. This is one of those changes that really is more of a transitional change that will see a huge change in, like I said, the way the way we're all doing uh, operations style of work, and also the way we collaborate with the developers to do. To do work. So. It's a new operating model also. I think we've touched on this a little bit already, but as you can tell, it's a complete new operating model. You know, we, we throw away um, a lot of the, the traditional tools that have made up what we traditionally know as operations. You know, so when we think of things like, um, maybe I push out software with something like SCCM, you know, these traditional sets of tools are no longer really used in the sense when we start talking about containers and creating container images and pushing container images and, and deploying that sort of software. We won't be really talking so much about how um, Docker integrates with traditional uh, aspects of software, because there are some things that it will still um, touch on. Um, but it's important to know that it's a completely new operating model. And this is a really big change, because a lot of, it can be really scary, right? We look at this and we go, ah, you know, a complete new operating model is like, you know, we have to rethink about how we've done everything so far. So deployment, packaging, um, monitoring, all these sorts of things just completely change. Um, but that's the kind of fun thing as well. That's the industry we're in, right? We're in an industry that always changes. This is, this is part of it. You really have to be open to change. And that, you, know, you probably wouldn't be at a conference like this if you weren't open to change. And going on from you know, what everyone's been saying so far, we, we're changing. You know? This morning was a really good indicator of, of what, what's happening with the products that we love. Everything's changing so much. And again, this kind of falls into line um, with that concept. So you might have heard of um, these, you know, the errors. You remember there's like this uh, 20 years of Windows Server 
are on the site that I think Jeffrey talked about maybe last year or throughout the year. But basically, you know, there's a concept of these stages that we've gone through, right? So there was a server for the masses, you know, back in the day when it was like everyone had a server, it was like running NT and under their desk or something. And we kind of moved through these stages where we went, um, you know, up through the enterprise era and the data center era up into the born in the cloud era that we're in today. You know, and that kind of comes back to, to this slide here. And I wanted to, you know, just kind of highlight this a little bit to say like this, this is a sense for modernized born in the cloud type applications. So when we talk, talk about software development and um, running software on things like Docker, we're talking about uh, applications that are built in a way where they have a very minimal footprint, they're very fast. Think, think .NET Core, you know, we're, we're moving to .NET Core anyway. So you can think about that as you know, being a perfect um, uh, framework for something running in a container. It can be a little bit hard if you start to go back and you know, like, I want to run assembly in a container or something like that. You know, that's the sort of thing that can have um, additional overhead or some, or maybe not assembly is the best example because it's very low, but something that requires, um, you know, more monolithic old school traditional style frameworks to, to really build up is um, not always going to be the best option in a container. And yeah, it's not for things like domain controllers. You know, you don't go and run your, um, you know, your production workloads, like your production SQL server that powers your whole business on a set of containers um, at the moment. But it's, uh, it's something that um, <laughs> might be on the horizon. Okay, so yeah, how did we get here? You know, so we've really evolved through the physical server. This was something that we all, you know, we all loved bare metal at one point. We we're all about, you know, bare metal. Like we just, we wanted to have those physical servers. That was what really made us happy. Uh, and we, we really went through the stage during in the, um, the server for the masses stage and the enterprise era, right? We, we loved that. We built data centers. We, we rolled out Windows Server 2003 to everything. We had these huge racks, huge um, data centers. And we kind of got to a point where we're like, this is costing a lot of money, you know? And we have maybe one app or two apps running on some physical hardware. And we, we said, hey, we need more apps, or we need more space, or we need you know, to continue this further. You know, how do we you know, logically move to the next step, um, both financially uh, and efficiently as far as technology is concerned? And we came, up, we came up with, of course, the virtual machine, right? We said, oh, let's just run multiple servers on this one server. That's a really good idea. You know, that, way, that way we can have you know, an encapsulation layer and, and separate things to say, yeah, we just have this VM and this VM. And this became the way that we did things, right? This was, this was normal. So essentially what we're doing here and what containers represent is essentially the next level of inception, I guess you think of. The next level of going one layer down, right? Where what we're doing is instead of having your complete separate VM, you just have a separate process. You can share the underlying operating system with the kernel of the underlying operating system to run whatever process you need. If that has shared binaries and libraries with another application, those can be consumed also. So it's, it's essentially, you know, we said um, you know, as a whole community, as a whole industry, we said, hey, this license is really expensive. I don't want to pay for 50 licenses. How about I just pay for one license and then run 50 processes, right? Of course, you have things like resource management and all that sort of stuff as well, which is a huge factor in something like Docker, but it essentially encapsulates the next layer as far as we talk about as going down the rabbit hole. So what does a container look like? Uh, you can think of a container as a, a way, you know, as a stack. Like you can think of it like in a stack structure. Uh, we still have a server, right? There still has to be a server somewhere. You know, it's, it sounds all magical, but there's, there's still a server there somewhere, whether it's physical or it's running in the cloud, it's still a server. It still has to have a host operating system. So you might still run Linux, you might run Windows. In this case, we're talking about Windows server containers. And you have a Docker engine. So the Docker engine represents, you know, being able to, to, to create those containers. You need some sort of, um, application as such, and that is essentially Docker, to actually start those containers and to allow that level of uh, nesting virtualization or process encapsulation. So then we could have multiple apps. So, you know, I, I have, maybe I have an app written in Golang and I have an app in Node.js or something like that. I want to be able to run all these apps. I don't, I don't want to just run one on, on uh, you know, on one whole host. Maybe I have a very strong host and I want to be able to you know, run 50 apps. Um, you know, you can do that by basically offering up the binaries and libraries for those specific applications and you know, separating them in encapsulation. So the containers can't talk to each other. They're completely, um, you know, they don't actually know that another container actually exists, who's its, who's its neighbor. You know, essentially, the way we think of a virtual machine running on a hypervisor, it doesn't really know there's another VM right there, you know, unless it had some sort of connection to it. But um, it's, it's completely separated in that sense. So we can think of the container as like an encapsulation on the application layer. Five reasons I was. Cool. So um, some of the issues that containers can help solve, I think we've all had these issues. You know, traditionally, as an ops guy as well, like there's been so many issues in, in, the, in the Windows space when we start going back to Windows Server 2008 and all that sort of stuff. You know, 
all these fun things we've maybe done at one point in time, like Windows updates or you know user management. Unrequired features is a crazy one. Like this morning, what Will was saying about you know, uninstalling things you don't need. Like these are unrequired features that we usually just overlook. Things like configuration drift, configuration management goes out the window. You don't use configuration management like Docker. There's no need to have configuration management because you cannot really get configuration management drift. And there's no need to essentially have something that might require a certain state. You can do that. And if you, you build that at first, you, know, you kind of create that and define what it is at the very start. And then from that point, it, if it does change, you've got some serious issues because it should be deleted and essentially recreated at that point. But we'll cover that a little bit in the demos as well. Things like image size as well, like, you know, when we start talking about um, the image sizes of our servers, they can be huge, right? Like, you know, we talk about Windows Server full GUI, right? I mean, if anyone's running Windows Server full GUI still, it's, uh, that's a big issue. But still, you know, more on the, you know, that, that thing is huge, right? Like, I think on 2012, it was like, it was definitely over 10 gig, that's for sure. Um, so that sort of thing, these sort of things can go away as well because we start um, shedding away what we don't need, making them as small as possible and making them as fast as possible. And startup times. Like, if you haven't seen the startup times of a container, it's, it's crazy. So, I highlighted these. Okay, so container management. There's a few different tools in the container management orchestration space. So, you might have heard a few of these. So, Azure have the Azure Container Service, Amazon have the Elastic Container Service, and there's Rancher as well, which is a really awesome. Um, container management and orchestration platform, and also Google's Kubernetes. So these are like the, the four kind of big ones at the moment um, that you might see out there that really like get you going in the in the container space. Um, and those are really handy. So in the next in this, this next slide here, I want to show you essentially. You know, doc, uh, um, sorry, GitHub can be one of those places where you, if you look at if you look at GitHub, sometimes you can be really taken back in the complexity of some of the projects. Right? You can go. Hey, there's this really cool project by like Netflix, or there's this really cool project that lets you, you know, turn pictures into text or something like that. But it's written in C++, and I have no idea how to make it or how to use it or, or anything. So I want to show you like essentially how Docker can abstract complexity and allow you to really understand software at at, at a finer layer, uh, and really be able to run applications and help contribute to things. So. Okay, so I've just pulled that repo down from uh, GitHub, and if you just have a look at the Docker file, so we haven't really talked about a Docker file yet, essentially, but quickly, you know, the way a Docker file works is essentially a, sub, a set of commands, or it's basically a text file that lets you step through and associate layers with your image. So when we talk about an image, you can think of something, you know, if you're familiar with something like SCCM, where we all had golden images that we deployed out, you know, we're going back to that, that concept again with Docker images, right? We, we're defining a couple of steps that we actually want to run um, and then we want to have our application running or our image created based on those steps. So at the moment, I'm just going to be doing this on um, this first demo will just be on my on my uh, laptop, which is not Windows specific, but the next one will be in Azure. I just want to show you the uh, removal of some complexity here. So I have this uh, here. Um, all I simply want to do is create an image from this. So I'm just going to do a Docker build. I'm just going to do it in the current repo. And I'm just going to tag it as um, example. So you can see what happens here, and it was really, really quick. So basically, I, because I have some caching going on, because I wasn't really 100% trust in the Wi-Fi. Um, but essentially, there's a, a couple of things happening here. So we have some steps happening, right? And you can think of steps as layers. So in this sense, we have um, the concept of uh, it, the first step is actually going, OK, where do I start with this? Like, this is an image. You're creating a new image. But where's the base layer, right? I need something to base this on. So we're actually basing this on uh, another operating system called Alpine Linux, in this sense. Uh, then we, we make a working directory, so we're just doing a make dir, and then we have a working directory, which is our current working directory there. And then we run an npm install, because it's an, a Node.js application in, in a sense. Uh, we do some port exposure, and then we just run npm run, right? So we're just running our command as normal. And then now that we've created that, we can actually see that image available. So we just have a look at Docker images. It's just the, the third one there. So let's just do a, a Docker run, and we'll just do this, and I'll explain it here shortly. Okay, so what we're doing is we're starting that container up now. So we just made an image from that container. Now we want to start it because we want to run our application. That's how easy it is. You just create an image from it. If it has a Docker file, you just say build. All it says, all, all build expects is a Docker file, and then it just does the rest for you. So once you have that image and you've just run Docker run, um, the application will start. 
And what I've actually done here is something called port mapping. So there is, in, inside the container, it's a, it's a web application, right? This thing is a web application. It was, uh, it's written in Node. You can see from the repo that it's some sort of web application. In this case, it's actually um, one of Netflix's applications they use. And I need to be able to map that port inside the container to some port on my laptop so I can actually you know, communicate with that web server itself. So I'm doing something called ex port exposing or port mapping in this sense. So I can actually access that application now by just going to localhost. So this is um, that application just running on my machine here. So essentially, this is this is just an example, but this is a, an application that Netflix sort of used to keep track of the microservices that they have at Netflix. So there's a whole lot of stuff happening there, so they need to be able to keep track of where the data flows between things. Sort of irrelevant, but I just wanted to use it as an example to see, you know, if you have an application um, that you've either made yourself or you've seen something on GitHub that you actually want to use, it's really it's really cool because you'll actually find the majority of new projects these days are being built based on born in the cloud things, right? Like we're building things now that run on managed container services or even sometimes on serverless compute. Um, but we don't really care or we just want to get started and we don't really have to worry about the server operating system. So this is an example of, of that sort of thing. So, we'll just, um, so we can simply just list our containers that are running and I don't want this anymore so I can just kill it off. Um, all right. yes. It's that easy. So you can share that, you know, that image that you have now is immutable. It can't be changed. It's created. It's, 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 it's done. That can be shared with other people. I could say, hey, have a look at this. Like, I've, I've actually built this now and just, you know, pass it off to a colleague and he could also run the same thing and be guarantee, uh, guaranteed the exact same, um, you know, the exact same outcome of what's actually running there because it's immutable and it's all encapsulated in that image. All right, cool. So that's a, a basic example. And you can see you'll find most Docker files in, in, uh, in any sort of repository you have looked at on GitHub. Um, and if you don't, you can always propose one and say, hey, I, I want to you know, be able to run this locally. I want to understand, or I want to be able to help people abstract complexity um, from the project that I'm making. Yeah, that was So just having a quick look at that Docker image, like we said, everything is a layer. We talked about layers a little bit. So here we're just saying there's a start point. We, we need to have a base. And this, this could be nano server. It could be Windows server. Um, 2016. It could be, um, you know, or, or Linux in this sense. Um, but in this sense, in this case, we just have a, an example here, uh, and we just step through. So we have a starting point. We might want to run a few commands. Maybe I want to copy in a whole directory. Maybe I want to pull something down from the internet and store it locally inside the container. Uh, maybe I actually want to do something here. So this is this is sort of a space where you can do whatever you want in that sense. You can create your uh, the, what encapsulates the identity of an image. Uh, you might want to run some sort of uh, dependency injection in this case. I'm just doing an npm install, so to get those node, Mac, uh, node modules installed. And then I basically just start the container, right? I expose the port that I want because I know that my web server is actually going to be listening on that specific port. Um, so I can expose that port, and then the command that I choose to run to actually initialize the container or start the container is, is usually uh, a web server in this sense. It, in this example, it's a web server, but it can be whatever. So just a little bit more on layers, um, because it's, it's an important topic of the, of the image, essentially. Uh, you have things like caching as well. So you know, when I just built that image before, it was like, it's instant, right? Because it was like, yo, this is already cached. So I'm just going to kind of skip over this, skip over this. You know, he's already got this image locally, skip over this. So if you do change, for example, if I go and change this one file, everything else will be caged except for that file. So it's a really, really quick way to kind of go through and, and make an image. And if you make an image every time you've made a change, um, you know, th that's even not really such a bad idea because it's so quick. It's not really an issue. It's only an issue if you have like some sort of large dependency that you need to pull down, and which can take a while. So, but I guess a good question is like, what about the traditional sense? Like, why are we really going through all of this change, and what's what's really wrong with the traditional sense? So, say let's say we have these three applications, right? So, I have an application in uh, in .NET, or ASP .NET. I have a these are all web applications. Let's just assume. I have one in Node.js and I have one in Golang, right? So, so what's the issue with doing something like this? This is what we've always done, right? We just put a load, a load balancer behind our application and we scale our application out and that handles our web traffic, right? This is, this is usually how we've handled things and up until you know, talking about this now, this is still what we all do. So 
one of the issues with this is, you know, say, say we scale these out. We have three or six servers that run our uh, .NET application and six for the others and stuff like that. That can be quite expensive. And let's just think about what's involved in that, right? We have the guest operating system, and we have all of the things that the guest operating system has on it and all the dependencies it has, all the other packages that it needs just to run other things that aren't really even related to what your application is doing. So there's a lot of, there's, you know, there's been a lot of improvements in this space um, where, uh, you know, packages and um, operating systems have been slimmed down, like nano server is a really good example, of just removing things that aren't needed anymore because it costs money, right? We're running everything in the cloud now, so we shouldn't be paying for things we don't need. So we can kind of, you know, when we start thinking about this idea, it's like, well, I don't really want to have nine servers or ten servers that are just kind of sitting there running this application when I can do this in a more modern and uh, cost-efficient approach. So we do something like this, right? We, we have a container host that sits in front of it, right? We have a host that's responsible for receiving our incoming connections. We put a load balancer in front of that. So, you know, you can have more than one host here, and we'll talk about clustering a little bit later on. Um, but, you know, the idea here is that you're essentially passing off the responsibility of the load balancing to a container host. So the container host is the, in the, in the concept just before that we were messing with, the laptop was the container host because it was running the container. But in this sense, you know, we're going to have Windows Server 2016 as the container host. It's going to be running our containers. And if we have a request coming through, so this might be a request on just say port 85, right? Someone's hitting this container host on port 85. And you, of course, you could do some um, DNS magic here to make port 85 just the default or, uh, you know, for that specific app or that specific route. Um, but, you know, imagine this is the request coming through on port 85 to the load balancer's DNS name. It's going to route that request to whichever app has been mapped on that port of 85. So if you say in your ASP.NET application, hey, listen on port 85 for incoming requests, then it is only listening on that, on that port. So we simply just would map that, and there's some port address translation and NAT address, uh, network address translation and port address translation that actually happens in between here. A um, bit of a simplistic view on this because it, it's, it can be quite tricky to understand. So this is a good way to go through it. Um, but you know, you can think of it like that. So I have, a, I have a request coming through on port 85 that gets routed to whichever app is listening or been exposed to the container host on port 85. Just like I might have another one on port 8000 coming through that might be listening. You know, I have my, I have my Go, app, uh, Go app listening on 8000, so therefore that request will get routed to that container. And again, of course, for something like you, know, you can have whatever port. It's just the idea is that. The, the port on the request that you make in, inbound is actually going to get um, translated and passed to whichever container host is listening on that port. So what about databases and stuff like that? Like, you know, what about, what about if I, I don't, I don't want to expose a database to the internet. I don't want to get people to be able to do any sort of, you know, weird things with my database. So, you know, Node.js and, and MongoDB go, go hand in hand. So most apps you see in Node will have a MongoDB backend. So this is a pretty standard approach when it comes to things like this. You know, you'll have what we call a link. So containers don't know about any other container. They're completely isolated. They're completely, you know, they, you can't like ping another container from another container. It's just not possible. So the idea here is that you can link containers together. And when you link a container together, you actually have to provide it some sort of friendly name. And what actually happens is when you do this, when you perform this action, it actually goes to the host file and inserts the name of the other container so it knows about it. So it has a direct connection now to via uh, not only opening up the network to it, but also allowing to access via the, the safe name or the short name of that, of that service. So you, know, you have a request here coming in on port 5000, um, and it gets routed through the container host through to the Node app. The Node app obviously needs to pull data from, from MongoDB in this case, so it has a link directly to it. And it's a one-way trust, right? So that, that node app is only able to reach in and get data from there because it has an explicitly defined link to that container. So clustering. So this is you know, more of a realistic way of how we would handle something like this in production. Because you know, we, we want to have everything load balanced. We want to have everything highly available. You know, if you're if you're web if you run in like an e-commerce company like where I work, if your website goes down, you lose a lot of money and it's not fun. So if you want to run this sort of stuff, you'll be running it in, in uh, a clustered environment. So that would essentially work in a very similar way. You know, you have a load balancer in front of that, and you would have um, your containers or your, your services spread across multiple availability zones. So if you're running in the cloud, you're going to have them in multiple, um, multiple places or multiple data centers so that no sort of you know, catastrophic 
weird issues can happen and you just suddenly lose your whole website. So in that sense, you would have some sort of layout like this, right? You could have a shared database still that's running you know, anywhere. It could actually be running in a VM. It could be running uh, even on-prem or something like that. And you could have your, uh, your container, or your, the front end of your web application kind of horizontally scaling out in containers uh, based on the cluster of that. So you could have two, multiple container hosts in, in uh, multiple different availability zones that are responsible for balancing the load between uh, the containers for your web application. So uh, let's um, jump into, I spun up a container host on Azure um, because I wanted to show you guys how this kind of works here. So we have a container host running and you'll have to excuse me, like I, I basically, it's running full GUI windows. I don't know why, but it was the default option for some reason, so here we are. <laughs> uh, so, you know, this is really cool because check this out, right? So like this is what, um, so Windows Server 2016, like I said, comes with a feature for enabling containers. Uh, this doesn't actually install the Docker engine, it just kind of enables the functionality of container capabilities. Um, there's also, there's a, there's a package provider for, uh, for Docker, which you can just simply install. And it, but this, this image, which is actually labeled uh, Windows Server 2016 with containers, which you can find in Azure, it just comes with everything set up. So you don't need to do anything, which is pretty cool if you want to pick the tires. So let's have a look at some images, right? Like, so here I have Docker images. I did the same thing on my laptop before. You know, it's the, one of the really cool things here is we're talking about true cross-platform here. You know, I can have the exact same experience on my MacBook Pro as I do on Windows Server, right? Like, this is what Docker really uh, enables in that sense. So we have things like uh, Nano Server, right? We, we all love Nano Server. All, uh, you know, we, this is one of the, the greatest um, leaps forward as far as getting to that point of really making a really small footprint and paying far less for what we do with our, with our, uh, with our servers. So Nano Server is something that uh, we'll go through a bit more here in a second. But we can obviously still run things like Server Core, right? You can still, you can still choose to deploy Server Core containers or Nano Server containers. So you're not really defined to say, I, oh, I have to use Nano Server from now on. It's like, no, you can still run uh, Server Core and, and any sort of workload that might run on Server Core. Uh, but you have to understand the sizing, the sizing differences, which you can kind of see here, um, includes all of the layers that are associated with that image. So this image, that's, these are officially provided by Microsoft in this sense. Uh, this image contains layers that might have uh, things in it, but you know, it has a lot of things in it, in sense of essentially making up 10 gigabytes of, of um, total space, as opposed to Nano Server, which they've, they've shipped out at 1.1 1. Uh, 1 gigabytes. So what I've done down here as well is I've made my own, um, I've taken the Nano Server image, um, and I've removed, well, I just got one that doesn't have IIS on it. So if you just do something like a Docker search, and have a look at Microsoft, you can see all of the images that I've made available. And they're really doing a, an amazing job here to, to really kind of keep the environment and keep the community up to date with images as they make them. So they do like nightly builds on things as well to, to make sure that these images are up to date and um, you know, they have things like um, you know, the latest versions of things that are available. So ASP, Net, and uh, you know, even SQL Server, right? SQL Server for Linux in a container is available, and it's actually quite widely downloaded as well. And you know, it's capable of doing a whole bunch of awesome tests and everything, which we can have a look at shortly. But what I want to go through here is just having a look at this Docker file we have here. So I've just got a Docker file here, and it's so simple. It is, it is just starting at a base layer. So I'm just saying, hey, get this image that's um, in my um, repository or registry, I should say. Uh, it's called Nano Server Node.js. It just has Nano Server on it and the Node.js binary in the libraries. That is it. It has nothing else on it. It is just completely raw, and that's why it's able to be 600 megabytes. So after that, I want to uh, make my working directory, the current directory, which is the one that I'm in. I want to copy or add all of the current content indicated by the dot into the directory called source. Once it's in there, I'm going to do an npm install and an npm start. Right? I'm going to start my application. So. That's how, that's how simple that is. So all I have to do is a Docker build in the current directory, and I'll just call it node app. And it's done. So that you can kind of compare what that was just then to building a brand new server, deploying the operating system, deploying Node.js, and getting the application deployed to the server which would probably take a long time in a, in a traditional environment, I guess. So here we have that image built now. And you can see the difference here, right? So we have the, the, here's the one that I built it from, the base that I just built it from, 677 megabytes. 
And you can see when I added in my projects, then I just did a, I did an add for my current directory, copied that in. It was ended up being 683 megabytes. So this application that I, I want to show you is just a, a basic application that I built for the purposes of this demo. It's um, an app called Beer Time, as you can kind of tell by the, the name of this. So um, it's a, a simple way just to kind of type in the name of the beer that you might like, and you can get some more details about the beer. <laughs> it's kind of used for demo purposes here. So what we'll do is um, we'll run this, right? So we're going to do a Docker run. We're going to run it in detached mode. I don't want to interactively enter this container, which we can do, and we'll do that after this. You know, um, you can interactively enter a container as you run it as well, but I don't really want to do that. Um, I'm also going to pass in an environment variable. I'm going to say that the environment variable I want to pass in is going to be called API key. Because I have an API key for my application that allows me to connect to a third-party API to retrieve information about peers. So I'll pass that in with the E tag. I'm going to pass in the D tag to detach. I'm going to pass in the port, which is going to be 5,000, which I'll map to 5,000. And I need to pass in the name. That's it. That should start up now. So you know, it's it's um, and you can actually keep track of it. So while it's actually starting up, so the the building of the image was really quick, right? Like all it did was just go, hmm, all right, let's have a look in the current working directory, like indicated by the dot, and copy all that content in. You can see that what I actually did here was with the CMD or with the start command, I actually said, you know, do an npm install. So it's actually going to install the dependencies inside the container. So you have you have a, you have a couple of options here, and this is you know, there's multiple ways of doing it. But the idea is, in in this sense, what I wanted to indicate was that. You can do commands inside the container. Um, you know, you can indicate run this command when you first come to life, and in this, in this case, it's going to do an npm install and then start the start the container. Of course, you can do um, an npm install and, and get all the dependencies together before you even create the container, and then just copy those dependencies in. There's really, um, you know, there's two ways of doing it here, and you can go for the complete immutability, or you can go for um, the speed of, of creating uh, the image in the first place. So we can have a look, if we just have a look at our container, so if we can see um, our container is listed here, ED. So we can sort of docker logs on this, and you can actually see the output of the uh, the standard output stream of that container. So we can see that our application is running on port 5000. So all we have to do is just get the IP address, because uh, this is a public public server, public facing server, I could say, and just navigate to port 5000, and we get our application. So, if, like you guys can hit this app as well, and it will be running um, just as you would expect as a normal application would. So you can um, type in the name of the beer. There's actually this really cool beer in in the Netherlands um, where I live called Desperado. I don't know if you guys like this beer, any other Dutch guys in here, but it's it's pretty cool. Um, it's like tequila beer. I don't know if anyone knows tequila beer. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but you know, the idea is is simple here. You, you know, to create to to go from nothing to having a repository, to having a fully working app available in like 10 seconds or whatever it is, or 20 seconds, is kind of ridiculous. And it's something we haven't really you know, been able to do in the Windows space ever, really. We haven't really been able to do this before. Um, you know, when we, when we go from the idea of not having an operating system and just being able to go, well, here's my repo, good luck, right? We're really moving away from the, the concept of having to Think about the operating system on a, on a traditional sense. We're really you know, focusing more of it on this this lightweight, um, rapid way of, of doing software development. Okay. Did anyone try my app? All right, so just to summarize um, a few key points. So I'm going to start at the bottom here because I actually just added this in when I was sitting there before because it was something that Jeffrey mentioned. This this concept is really part of transformational change. Like what we're talking about here is is a huge change to the way we do things, and it's a huge learning curve. Like I, I still wouldn't even um, want to say I would know. I, I guess like 10% of what all of Docker is. It's a huge beast, and there's a lot of people who have. A ton of experience out there, you know, running really modernized web applications in Docker. Like a lot of the big companies, like when you start talking about, you know, Netflix and, and the big players in the field, they, they, this is sort of like, you know, for them, it's been something that they've been doing for quite a while. But this sort of thing is, you know, really requires a big transformational change, not only in your culture um, at, at certain workplaces, but also within the teams and the, and the, um, the willingness of your teammates to really start thinking about this and adopting it. And um, in the, it's, it's, if you're interested in this sort of stuff and um, I guess at the first thing you can really start to do is just really go, you know, how can we incorporate something like this? Or will we actually get benefit from something like this? If, if you know, you just have 
100 web servers at work and they're all running Windows Server 2008 full GUI, you know, that's a pretty hefty VMware bill, right? Like, or, you know, when you start paying for maintenance on the storage or maintenance on the SAN or something like that, you know, it, it can add quite up. So there's a lot of uh, managed services that are available. Like one of the, some of the ones we went through before, like Azure Container Service and uh, EC2 Elastic Container Service, that um, can really abstract a lot of that complexity away and offer a solution to sort of push into uh, into a state where you can start to really focus on, on saving money uh, and being financially um, more refined in that space. So, yeah, I, I think one of the best things to get into in this sense is just pick up an app, like just either pick up a really basic application like the one that we were just looking at before on, on GitHub, like just grab the Docker file, play with it yourself, or just make your own application and just really understand the process um, of around how Docker would fit with your application, like how do they tie together. Um, that will really help you open up the insights into, into um, playing around with it and really understanding it. Um, container orchestration systems, there's a lot of fads around container or orchestration and, and management systems. There's like everyone will be like, hey, I'm the best one, like to pick, pick us, like, you know, you, can, you might hear a lot of people saying, oh, I need Kubernetes or I need this. It's like, well, just talk to me about the actual issue or, or what you're trying to solve. Um, so that, that's something that can, that can be kind of uh, overwhelming when you first start looking into it because everyone has a really strong opinion about what you should be using. But just remember that it's, it's you know, pick up, pick up something at your own pace, and really have a look at it, and really make your own assessment on, on what you should and uh, should be diving into when it comes to, to the container management space. So it's you know, take it upon yourself, I think, to learn more about um, applications as opposed to what they're running on. Like I, as an ops guy, like I've, I've been in the case where I'm, I'm really obsessed and really want to know more about what it's running on. Like what what are the resources like? What it's running on? What's the hardware like that it's running on? What's the networking like? What's the you know, what's the physical aspect of this thing? Like what is this physical thing? But as the days go by, we're really starting to have this more and more abstracted from us. I'm sure we've all seen that lately. Like this is where the cloud is going. Abstract that away, right? This is you know you just you just push you you just push a GitHub repo somewhere now, and it just deploys your application. That somewhere can be any cloud provider or any container orchestration system. But the more we're seeing is is that the the operation side or the server side is being more and more abstracted away, and there's more and more focus on um, developers being able to develop or or um, operations and development teams working together to better deliver software and better uh, deliver better working software and well-tested software. So this is something that we're seeing more and more of in, uh, in, in every field that I've seen so far. Okay, so I think that wraps up to this. Uh, yeah, does anyone have any sort of questions about this sort of stuff? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. So there's a default network that Docker actually installs as a provision. So when you say like you know when you install Docker and the Docker engine comes with a default network, there you can get away with using the default network um, like it, a lot of the time, unless you're in a production sense where you want to have your own subset of networks and all that sort of stuff. Then you would really start digging into Docker networking, which is a whole other topic. But realistically, you know that that can be the case if you take it upon yourself to create your own VM. Uh, and then you're managing that VM and building the Docker infrastructure on that. Or you can look at it from the side where, hey, there's a, there's a, a managed service that actually provides me uh, an abstraction layer of the, even the virtual machine. So you don't even really need to worry about that sort of stuff anymore with things like Azure Container Service and, and Amazon as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. It's, yeah, and, and one of the things is, um, you know, Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows, which actually are um, running a Linux VM underneath the hood to run, to run Docker, um, they are really modern and really well-refined applications. Like that, I, I've been running um, Docker for Windows on my Windows laptop for quite a while, and it's been amazing. Like it, you can you can do exactly the same. You get exactly the same user experience as you do running on Docker for Mac, or if you jump on Windows Server, you, you get exactly the same experience, which is really, really, um, really awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so so one of the, like the one of the um, the question is how would you monitor the containers and such like because you know, there's so many things happening so fast and they can be in transient states, right? One might be on for a moment, then off, and it might finish its task. And then so the idea, in a sense, is that with a container, we only ever have one process running in a container at a time, right? We never say, hey, this container has these six things running, and then these five, you know, we don't go on that path because it just creates complexity and overhead, and then we start having to think about other management techniques and stuff, right? So. 
in a sense, you know, there's a lot of monitoring tools out there, and a lot of the modern monitoring tools have the ability to actually look in from the outside and actually uh, have a have a good look at what's running, on, like what the processes are running, uh, what the utilization of a certain resources for a given namespace. So they can kind of go, hey, here's your container host. Let's have a look at what's running. Um, okay, so this container is using X, Y, Z amount of resources. So things like um, Datadog and um, there's other uh, cloud-based monitoring tools, so things like CloudWatch and um, Azure's own uh, monitoring system kind of look at the outside and they don't really install an agent as such in each container, but there might be an agent on the container host. So the container host is actually responsible for passing the metrics for all of its containers running um, underneath it. So that's essentially, it's, a, it's more of an approach where we look from the outside looking in as opposed to from the inside reporting out. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you can, you can, the question is, uh, what other applications can you run in, in a container other than a web application? There's no, there's no sort of hard rule. Like, no, no one's saying, don't run this. And the only reason I was saying, you know, like, don't run a domain controller in there is because, you know, if that's something that pieces together your, your enterprise, it's, it's really, really, you know, you need to be really, really sure about what you're running it on uh, and really, really knowledgeable in that space. But there's no sort of hard limit about what you can and can't run. You know, like I was saying before, if you, if you just simply jump on, um, So I just quickly grabbed the, um, the like even the PowerShell image, right? Like Docker run IT, well, PowerShell on Linux in a container in like one second, right? I didn't even have PowerShell installed on my Mac, but that's running PowerShell inside a container within a second, right? So the idea is that there's no limitation about what application. Yeah, this would be this would be six eighteen, I guess. Let's have a look. Uh, it's 618, yeah. Yeah, what for? Yeah, of course, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. So if you have a reason to do it, you, I can't think of a reason off the top of my head you would want to run PowerShell in a container in this sense. It's more so just saying there's no limit of applications of what can be run, right? right? So even, even SQL Server or something like that, for example, is available and can be run for testing purposes. So say, say, say you have a, a continuous integration deployment pipeline, right? SQL Server, yeah, on Linux. Yeah, you'd have to have it spread across, um, you'd have to have uh, like a read replica essentially in place and you'd have to have <laughs> some other things. I don't think many people are running production SQL Server on, on Linux yet, but uh, it's possible. The idea is that it's possible. So, I mean, in th things for testing as well, you know, it, it just makes huge impact in testing. If you have um, a pipeline that involves, hey, maybe spin up this server and run these SQL queries, your continuous integration and deployment pipeline could spin up that, that container in the process, do the tests, and then destroy the container, right? Even if it's fake data or such. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for production as well. So the idea is that the same image is used for all environments, right? The same image you make on your laptop is the same image that gets deployed for testing, acceptance, and production. Yep. Sure, if SAP, if potentially if, if SAP made an official Docker image that they were supporting, then it could potentially be the case. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, of course, and, and that's what the, the registry is for. So there's essentially the the, um, the Docker registry that's available. So if you just type in Docker search, you can kind of see what's available um, out there to really, you know, and of course there's no official um, SAP one on there as you would kind of expect at this point, but, um, you know. Sorry? Too soon, yeah, just. <laughs> but, you know, in the sense of what Microsoft are doing as well, like, you know, we just were saying, um, SQL Server. This this can be run as simply as just uh, doing. Yeah, I was going to download it, but because I didn't have it available. But that's how easy it is to get certain things, right? So if I say I want SQL Server or I want this because I want to test something, maybe you're developing a new application and you want to see if it's compatible with Microsoft SQL Server. 
this is exactly the first step you would take. You wouldn't hook up your production SQL Server to see if it works. You would want to develop locally with the SQL Server on the machine. Yep, good question. How can we persist storage? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. That's a good question. So the question is how to persist data across containers and such. So what we can do is we actually can do what we call volume mapping. So the volume is essentially not stored. The data itself is not stored in that specific container. Like data can be an example. The data could be on my laptop, and the container that I interface with could be created to map to that data storage. So the actual container can be destroyed at any time, but the data is persistent on whichever disk it is at that time. So my laptop or um, running on an a instance back, uh, sorry, EBS store in AWS or some store in any cloud, really. It doesn't matter. It's just about mapping that data, to, or mapping the container to data. Yeah. Yeah, so, so essentially, as part of your automation to create a container, you would say, hey, start up and hook to this data. And, and then and if that's part of your initialization, um, it is. Yeah, it's just called volume. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the question is how to manage versions of the images. So essentially, um, you know, every time we create an image, we do something called tag, right? And if we don't tag it, it comes with a default tag called latest. So if you just said, if you just did Docker build again on that repo that I just built a minute ago, it would just get another tag called latest and override that image, unless I gave it a different name. So essentially what you do is you tag it with a version. And this would happen automatically as part of your continuous integration pipeline. So when you actually have an image or you have a repo, you would push it up, and your, uh, your continuous deployment or integration deployment pipeline would look at the current version, look at what you're proposing, and then kind of create a new version and push it into the registry. So you, you kind of have to, you, you would end up with 100 different versions in that case, right? So you have to have some way of kind of cleaning that up. And, and that becomes sort of like a little bit of a management overhead because you need to you know, while they're not huge, you still need to make sure that you don't have just a thousand images laying around. Yeah. You, you can, you can. You, yeah, instead of saying just like from, oh, I want Node.js, you can say I want Node 4.3 in the registry and pull specific versions because each of these container, uh, sorry, each of these images that we're looking at here is kind of just the front, but you can actually get a specific version of that that's available. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Couple more minutes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. So you want to up update the image or the actual? You mean the the the? Yeah. So. You, Yeah, so in, in a sense, when we're talking about containers in general, the under, whatever, whatever the, if you're talking about the host, like the actual host that it runs on, yeah, the container underneath. Yep, yep, yeah. So when we're talking about that, yeah, yeah, it has to. The idea is that there's no management as such. So you don't go on a box or you don't go into a container and update. You destroy it and make a new one. So when you go from uh, IAS or from this, that comes with the latest version of updates. So for example, if I just pull Nano Server now, that has the latest updates in it because Microsoft pushed that image up with the latest images, uh, latest updates in it. So it takes away the need to have the Windows updates anymore. Okay, I think that's, uh, I think that's my time, guys. Thanks.